Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What does Jesus's mission look like here? What's his mission here? What does Jesus's mission look like here? What does Jesus's mission look like here? What is Jesus's mission here? How do I know what Jesus's mission is? Well, good morning, Wallace Bible. Good to see you today. And uh, my name is Josh. If you don't know me, one of the pastors here. And welcome to all of you joining us online. Really glad you can be with us today too. And today we start uh, a big journey into the New Testament book of Acts. And it's gonna take us uh, through pretty much the entire next calendar year to work our way through, all the way through. We'll take some breaks here and there, but we're gonna work our way through the entire book of Acts. And so uh, today's an exciting day as we start that, but it also means as we get going, we've got a lot to cover today. So would you pray with me? And then we're gonna jump in and, uh, and get rolling right away. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. And uh, thank you, Lord, as we've prayed already, that uh, you, uh, you sent Jesus to us to save us and redeem us and rescue us. And then Jesus, you sent uh, the Spirit and you sent him to come and, uh, and change us and empower us and be with us so that we wouldn't be alone. And to empower us for your mission, which you gave us. And so uh, help us to discover that, uh, to see that, that you haven't quit doing uh, your work, that, that you're still at work now in your church, just as you were in the book of Acts, and you will be until Jesus, your return. So Holy Spirit, uh, use me today, speak to and through me as we uh, look at your word that you wrote, and uh, pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you got your Bible, uh, open up to the book of Acts. Acts is in the New Testament. And uh, if you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, you're close. Just keep turning to the right and you'll get to the New Testament book of Acts. And we're just gonna start right here in verse one and start working our way through this New Testament book. So let's look at it together. Uh, Luke starts off writing. He says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, when he says uh, the first book, does that raise any questions for you? I mean, when, you when you read God's word, you read it with some inquisitive eyes going, oh, what's he talking about? The first book. Well, the first book is actually the gospel of Luke because the writer of the book of Acts is a guy named Luke, who we're gonna see here in a moment was a doctor. And he wrote the gospel of Luke as one volume and then he wrote the, the, the uh, account of Acts as the second volume in that same series. In fact, if you could see them both on a scroll, they're both almost the same length. They follow the same conventions of ancient historiography and uh, uh, Luke was writing a history of Jesus and now the early church and how the church began. And, and he writes to this guy named Theophilus. I've never known a Theophilus, have you? Theophilus means uh, lover of God or it can mean loved by God. And so there's different opinions of who Theophilus was. Some believe Theophilus was just a friend of Luke's, obviously, who had some cash and funded Luke going and writing all of these accounts because in the Gospel of Luke, Luke also writes, and he calls him most excellent Theophilus. Well, because of that, uh, that greeting in the Gospel of Luke, some people think, well, most excellent. Uh, maybe Theophilus was a Roman official. And there's, there's a possibility of that. Um, I think it makes, would make sense that maybe uh, one theory that's thrown out is that Theophilus was a Roman official who might have even been in charge of Paul's trial. And so Luke was writing these things to be submitted at Paul's trial as evidence. And that's why Acts ends in chapter 28 with nothing else happening after that. You don't find out what happens to Paul in his trial. He's just on trial. That's a possibility. There's smarter guys than me that say, no, I don't think that's true. So you, you might believe them and not me. Um, 
Or some have contended that Theophilus just means all those who love God. There isn't a real person named Theophilus, but I think there probably was a real person named Theophilus. But anyway, that's enough talking about him. The reality is it's written to him and it's also though written to us. So in the first book, O Theophilus, Luke says, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. The I there is Luke. Uh, Do you know much about Luke? Luke was a doctor. We learned that in Colossians chapter four. He's called the most beloved physician. He's only mentioned three times in the New Testament, yet he is responsible for writing more of the New Testament than any other author in terms of length. Between the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Acts, he wrote an incredible portion of the New Testament. Uh, He's probably not Jewish. He was probably very close to Paul because one of the things as we get later into the book of Acts and into Paul's ministry, you're gonna read, uh, Luke's just gonna write about things that happened and then all of a sudden, instead of just saying, you know, Paul did this, he's gonna say, and we. Well, who's the we? There's Paul and there's Luke. Luke is the we. And uh, he's a doctor. And so uh, he's he's very detailed. He's kind of an investigative reporter. He's trying to make an orderly account, we read in Luke chapter one in his first gospel of of all the things that happened so that that we would have a history of those things and we would know what was true. And so Luke would go and he would talk to eyewitnesses, people who grew up with Jesus, people who, who knew Jesus personally, who did ministry with him, who had interacted with him. And he would interview them. Likely, some believe, and I kind of do too, that he probably interviewed uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, because there's things about Mary we learn from the Gospel of Luke that are recorded nowhere else. And Luke is writing an orderly account. Uh, He's investigating what happened. Um, And he's a traveling companion of Paul. We, We, they did ministry together, they worked together, they were friends. I mentioned Luke was a doctor, so... uh, He was probably very well educated. I mean, I don't know a doctor that's not, right? He also was probably somewhat wealthy. I haven't ever really met a poor doctor. Um, So Luke was a key cog here in the wheel of the early church. Now, uh, the last thing about Luke is that he stayed faithful to Jesus. There's a record about him outside of the Bible in church history. And here's, here's what it says. Uh, it, it is written about 100 years after Luke's life, um, after these events. He, says, he writes, indeed, Luke was an Antiochian Syrian a doctor by profession, a disciple of the apostles. Later, however, he followed Paul until his martyrdom. So, so Luke ended up even dying for Jesus. Serving the Lord blamelessly, he was a faithful and godly man. He, he never had a wife, he never fathered children, and he died at the age of 84, full of the Holy Spirit. Who wants that on their tombstone? He died at this age, full of the Holy Spirit. What a great testimony of his life. And Luke was setting out to explain the gospel story. And here now to how the church began. But notice, uh, trust me, we're gonna go faster than we're going right now. In the first book, Theophilus, I, I've dealt, <laughs> dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. But there's one last thing here in this first verse that's key for us to note. And uh, that's this. He he wrote all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Uh, In his commentary on Acts, uh, a guy by the name of John Calvin, 500 years ago, one of the reformers, uh, wrote this. He said, from this, we must know, he's talking specifically about this phrase of all Jesus began to do and teach. We must note that those who simply know the bare history don't have the gospel unless there is added to it a knowledge of the teaching of Jesus' words, which reveals the fruit of the acts of Christ. And notice what he calls it. He says, for this is a holy knot, which may not be dissolved. Uh, Therefore, whenever mention is made of the teaching of Christ, let's learn to join it to the works as seals by which the truth is established. 
Uh, and he goes on, and basically what, what Calvin is saying here is that all that Jesus began to do, his actions, and all that Jesus taught, his words, are inseparably linked. Because have you ever noticed that some people, they really like all the things that Jesus did? I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't like the things that Jesus has done. That he was kind to children, that he was good to women, that he was uh, a respectable, faithful, single man, um, that uh, he healed people, that he stood up for the poor. I've never met anybody who says, I got a lot of issues with what Jesus did. I never have. Everybody seems to like what he does. Do you know where their issues are? With what he said. With his teaching. Not with all that he did, but with all that he said. Where he said, I am the way and the truth and the life and and no one comes to the Father but through me. Where he he tells us to repent and to to, uh, bear fruit in keeping with repentance and uh, to, to obey and to make disciples and his continual assertions that he is God. See, uh, I love what Calvin says here. He says, they're an inseparable knot. They're tied together and you can't untie them. You can't just have his deeds without his words. You have to make a choice. Is he really who he said he was and who he is? Uh, Well, uh, as we've read, uh, Luke is setting out to write, uh, his first account was all that Jesus began to do and teach until, verse two, the day when he was taken up. This is referring to his ascension, which we're gonna see at the end of the passage this morning. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Uh, Jesus uh, gave commands to the apostles and he does it through the Holy Spirit whom we're gonna see a lot of in uh, a study through the book of Acts. And these apostles in Acts 17, we read that that these are the guys, uh, they, they call them the guys who turned the world upside down following the commands that Jesus gave. And uh, here's the point. When Jesus was taken up, when he ascended and left the earth physically, he he didn't leave us with nothing to do. Uh, Jesus left us with a mission. He left us with a mission. He left us with things to do. Now, what are those things? Well, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and we see these in the other Gospels as well, but specifically we'll look at Matthew right now, we reread what's known as the Great Commission. This is at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus tells his disciples and probably about 500 people potentially, in my opinion, who are there listening, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always, even to the end. As you're doing this, I'm gonna be with you. Now the one command in here, sometimes we think, oh, it's go. Oh, it's teach. Oh, it's baptize. It's, it's actually make disciples. And the rest are participles that, that modify how we make disciples. One, we gotta go. We gotta go to people. Two, uh, we gotta teach them everything that Jesus taught, which we'll, we'll sum up here in another passage in a moment. Um, and... Uh, or to, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to help them identify with Christ, to, to come to faith in him. And Jesus says, as we go about doing this, he's with us powerfully to the very end. Well, that's the great commandment, or com, com, uh, the great commission. There's also the great commandment, the things that Jesus you know, teaching them to obey and observe everything he taught us and everything he commanded, it's summed up in two commands. They were trying to trap Jesus, the Pharisees were saying, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to them, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with all your mind. And then two, he said, this is the great and first commandment and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands, all the commands of the prophets rest and are fulfilled. So if we wanna teach people how to follow Jesus, they should learn to love God and love others and make disciples as they go. You know, that's our mission as a church. We are sent to love people, to invite them to follow Jesus with us. Now, we don't get to make up our own mission, right, as a church. Like, that's, that's God's domain. He, he gives us a mission. This is Jesus' mission. This is just how we've 
phrased it, and it's all right out of scripture that Jesus has sent us. He didn't leave us without something to do, but he actually sent us. So let's just talk a little more about that, kind of some of the things he sent us to do specifically. First off uh, is to tell God's story, to tell his story, to tell people about who God is, about who Jesus is, about what he's done, to, to tell the gospel, right? Not just telling everybody the things Jesus did, but the things Jesus said. Uh, that, that we need him to be redeemed and saved. See, for, for God so loved, here, here's the, the clearest and just most succinct uh, version of the gospel, I think, one of them anyway, in scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have what? Eternal life. God sent his son because he loved the world. Jesus says later in the Gospel of John, he sends us in the same way the Father sent him, to love the world. And Jesus said, uh, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. Now, uh, that's, we're gonna see, that's part of the role of the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. And Jesus will come and judge the world and those who haven't trusted him, but he, he sent his son into the world in order that the world might be saved through him, saved from his wrath, freed from their sin. That's God's story. He sent his son to save us. And then uh, Paul, we even read about Paul uh, telling God's story in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the twelve. Paul goes on and he keeps going. He says, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to the apostles. He, he tells what God's story is. He tells what God has done. But then notice he also um, ends up telling his story, which we're gonna see here in a moment. See, uh, Acts 1.8 uh, tells us you will, Jesus tells us a little bit later in our passage, I skipped ahead a bit there, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. This is a key verse in the entire book of Acts. We're gonna come back to it here in a bit. But a witness, what's a witness? Well, it, a witness is just somebody who tells what they've seen and heard. I mean, when you're on the witness stand in court, do you know what the judge doesn't care about? Your opinion. <laughs> he just wants to know, what did you see? What'd you hear? What are the facts? And as, as witnesses of Christ, we're to tell people the truth of the gospel, the truth of who God is. And that's what Paul does there in 1 Corinthians 15. But then also we're not only to tell God's story, but to tell our story, to tell your story. See, the greatest story ever told is the story of the gospel of what God's done for us. But you know what the second greatest story is? Is your story and how, that's, how that gospel has affected you and changed you. I wonder, when was the last time you told God's story to someone? When was the last time you told someone your story about what God has done specifically for you? I mentioned Paul goes on to tell his story after he tells God. He says, last of all, he appeared uh, to, one as, to one untimely born. He appeared also to me, for I'm the least of the apostles. He's kind of telling his story. I was, see, do you know Paul's story? He was uh, persecuting Christians. He was having them murdered and approving of it. He was dragging them out of their homes and breaking up families of people who loved Jesus. He was persecuting the church. And he's saying, uh, and last, he, he even appeared to me. I'm the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy to be called one because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It has nothing to do with me, in other words. It's a free gift, is what Paul says. And his grace toward me wasn't in vain. On contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it wasn't I, but it was the grace of God that is with me. See, when you share your story, what you're sharing is this truth, that uh, you don't deserve any of God's goodness, any of God's salvation. You don't deserve eternal life. I don't deserve it. 
In fact, I deserve to spend eternity in hell uh, under the, God's wrath for my sin. I don't deserve to be called this child, but it isn't about me. It's not about how good I am, it's about how good God is and his grace. And his grace came to me in Jesus Christ and so now I'm made new, I'm changed. I don't have to earn my favor before him but I get to live out the favor that he's put on my life. It's telling God's story and your story. The psalmist would do this, come here, all you who fear God and I'll tell you what he's done for my soul. What's God done for you? We were singing earlier, uh, give thanks to the Lord, his love endures forever. Be glad, this is the day the Lord has made. What's he done for you? Maybe you need to jot some of those things down, even in your notes this morning as you go. And be willing to open your mouth and tell that story to others. Jesus told the demoniac after he healed him, return to your home, he sent him out, declare how much God has done for you. Friends, one of the things we're gonna see in the book of Acts as God uh, births the church is that the mission of the church then is the same as it is now. And you know what a big part of it is? It's right here, going out and telling everyone the good things God has done for us. Telling them God's story, but also telling them your story. In a day and age when everything is relative, you know, they, they might think, ah, you can, I don't know about that. Jesus is the only way, I'm not so sure. You know what they can't argue with? They can't argue with your story. You can say, well, you might not believe, but let, but let me tell you what he's done for me. Let me tell you how he's changed me. And as you speak that and live that, the Holy Spirit will use that. But here's the deal, to do that, to, to share God's story, to share your story, it, it's really hard to do in your own strength, isn't it? Some of you maybe you're cringing right now thinking, I don't know that I wanna do that. I don't know that I can do that. <laughs> well, you're right, you can't. See, uh, Jesus left us with a mission, but to do it, we need his power. You need his power, I do, I need it. That's why Jesus said in verse eight, but you will receive power. You'll receive it, not stir it up, but you'll receive it when the Holy Spirit comes. When, it's coming, when he's come upon you, and, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Uh, one of the ways w we see God's power is in Jesus' resurrection. If we skip back again now to verse three, earlier here in, in Acts one, after Jesus appeared, uh, gave commands, uh, Luke tells us he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Luke doesn't tell us what all the proofs are, but we know a handful of them from scripture. And they must have been pretty convincing. Uh, one of them eats breakfast with his disciples on the beach. I mean, if, if you were at a funeral one day and then three days later, uh, you're out to breakfast with that guy whose funeral you were at and you watch him eat, you know, you talk for a while over breakfast. Would, would that be convincing proof for you that maybe he'd risen from the grave? Yeah. Or uh, some people came and they, they touched him physically, like Thomas. He's like, I'm not gonna believe until I see the wounds, until I can touch them. And Jesus says, here, put your hand here. Touch them, put your hand on my side. See, Thomas, and believe. He, 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 many convincing proofs over 40 days. It wasn't like just a, he, he, he you know, flashed in the sky for an hour and then it was really subjective. Does that, are you sure that's what you saw? No, he was around for over a month hanging out with these guys and interacting with people. And, and they saw him by many convincing proofs to be fully alive, this Jesus who had been crucified. And that resurrection, that, that power that raised Christ from the dead, Paul tells us in Ephesians is the same power that, that works in us. It's the same power that works in us. And the resurrection gives us hope. It gives us hope. You know, um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he says, if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sin. And, and those who've fallen asleep in Christ, they're, they're not with him, they're just dead. <laughs> 
But if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we're, we're to be the most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Peter tells us that uh, because of Jesus, we have a living hope through his resurrection. Not a hope that's dead, but a hope that's real. See, Luke tells us right off the bat, before we even get into to the activity in the book of Acts, that Jesus appeared alive, this one who was crucified, by many convincing proofs. And because of that, the, the church had incredible hope. And not only hope, but then Jesus sends a spirit and they have power. Because here's what Jesus says, uh, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is Luke continuing after he had risen from the grave, he appears to them, he's staying with them, and he says, hey, don't leave Jerusalem, but you need to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The Holy Spirit is coming as your helper, and, and the Holy Spirit will give you power. If the resurrection is hope, the, the Holy Spirit gives power. He, he would empower the early disciples, the early church for Jesus's mission. And by the way, uh, the Holy Spirit's God. God does not change. The Holy Spirit's still doing the same thing now that he did then. He's empowering his church, you and I, for Jesus's mission. That's why Jesus says uh, you to wait in Jerusalem and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to, to the ends of the earth, that's what Jesus says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. In uh, Luke 24, behold, Jesus says, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power. Wait for the Lord and his timing on things and, and, and lean into the power that he offers you in the spirit because the gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, Paul writes to the Thessalonians. And with full conviction, you know what kind of men proved to be among you for your sake. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony. I'm just showing you uh, multiple cases here where the Holy Spirit brings power. Well, uh, the disciples say to him in verse six, back to Acts chapter one, when they'd come together, uh, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, uh, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the father is fixed by his own authority. And there's that verse, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Friends, Jesus left us with a mission, but we need his power to do it. You know what we need? We don't just need an it. We need his power, but we need a person. We need the Holy Spirit. So the title of the message today says, wait for it. Wait for God's power. But it could also be wait for him. Wait for the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's not a force. He's not an impersonal being. Uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then look at what the Holy Spirit will do. He'll make us his witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. For the disciples, here's a map. Uh, they were in Jerusalem, which is kind of right down here in the corner. It's kind of blown up here. And Jesus says, in Jerusalem, you, you need to wait here because when the Holy Spirit comes, you're gonna be my witness. You're gonna tell people of what I've done. You're gonna tell my story and you're gonna tell your story, how, how that's affected you and you're gonna do it in Jerusalem. And then what's gonna happen is, and the power of the Spirit, it's gonna spread, and not just from Jerusalem, but also to Judea surrounding Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then even into Samaria. And finally, through you, in the power of the Spirit, the gospel is gonna spread. My mission is gonna spread to the very ends of the earth. <clears throat> even to some cornfields in Indiana. He didn't say that, but he implied it. You know, if Jesus had written this to us, uh, we have the same mission, friends. 
He's left us with a mission too, to be his witnesses. Uh, in his power, by the power of the Spirit in, in Wawasee, and in, in all of Kosciuszko County, or Noble County, or Elkhart County, wherever you might live. In fact, all of northern Indiana, the gospel will spread. And it'll spread even from here to the ends of the earth. And so we're to wait on the Lord for his power, for his strength, and then participate with the Holy Spirit in what he's doing on Jesus's mission, do you see? You'll receive power. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, uh, two men stood by them in white robes. Now, I kind of want to see this on video someday. Imagine they had been with Jesus for a few years of their life. They'd watched him die on the cross and they'd seen now uh, astonishing proofs that he was truly alive and he was with them and he tells them, you need to wait here until the Holy Spirit comes and then all of a sudden he just starts going up. But they're like, are you seeing this? And they watch and they just kind of, I mean, they, they had to have just stood there just like, what just happened? All right, we're waiting, so when's the spirit coming? Like, is he just gonna crash something on us right now? And I don't know how long they stood there just staring at the sky, but then uh, we read, um, two men stood by them in white robes. These are angels. And I wonder if they just walked up next to him and looked up. What are you looking at? Oh, did he really? Wow. And then, then, the, then the angel says this. He says, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. When he says, why do you stand looking into heaven? What they're implying is, what are you standing around for? Didn't he give you something to do? Go do it. You'll see him return. Don't worry, he'll come back in the same way you saw him go. So get busy doing what he sent you to do. And um, as, as we wrap this morning, there, there's some stuff here about the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to some of that just for the sake of time this morning. We've got a lot of time to work our way through the book of Acts. Um, but uh, let me just say this. In the mission that he's given us, because Jesus left us with a mission and to do it we need his power and we need the Holy Spirit. Uh, he does the same thing now as he was doing then. And one of the things he does is as he adds people uh, to the team, he gives them things to do. Uh, I got a baseball here. Some of you are really distracted wondering what in the world is Josh keeping in his pocket this morning? If you saw it back there. Um, do you know, uh, a couple weeks ago uh, was a week that sometimes is referred to, the week, referred to as the week of tears and cheers. Do you know what I'm talking about? It relates to baseball and to football. First is the tears. In the end of August, uh, in the NFL, they have to cut their roster from 80 down to 53. And so almost 30 guys lose their jobs. And then a couple days later, on September 1st, do you know what happens in Major League Baseball? The roster can go from 25 up to 40 active players for the rest of the season. And so every, every team, they can activate 15 more guys to be on the roster. But it almost never happens that they activate 15. Usually it's one or two maybe five or six that get activated. And almost every team, whether they're in the playoff hunt or not, they activate somebody. But I always wonder, like, why don't they activate all of them? I mean, if, if I was manager, I'd think, or if I was a player, I'd think, all right, September's coming. I get to put on a uniform. I get to sit in the dugout. I get to hang out with the guys. This is awesome. I'm in the big leagues. But why don't they activate all this? Because that's not what they do. They never activate all 15. Do you know why? because they just, they don't want bench warmers. They want people who are gonna play the game. And Jesus, when he sends his spirit, he gives us a mission, he clothes us with power, 
and he sends us out to do it. He, he doesn't recruit you to be part of his team, to trust him and to receive his spirit, to just sit on the bench and put on the uniform and go, woo, this is cool. He wants you in the game. So as we get into the book of Acts over the coming weeks and months, and you consider the work of the Holy Spirit in our church, in your own life, my prayer for you is that the Holy Spirit would move in such a way that, that you would see his call on your life to be about Jesus' mission. At home, at work, in the church, constantly sent as his people to love others and to invite them into relationship, to invite them to Christ and to follow Jesus with you and to get in the game and not just sit on the bench. Let me pray.